Good morning, and welcome to our continuing series, Questions and Answers, from the works of Sri Aurobindo and the Mother. Today, Equality, Part 3, from Sri Aurobindo. The equality of the thinking mind will be a part, and a very important part, of the perfection of the instruments in the nature. Our present attractive self-justifying attachment to our intellectual preferences, our judgments, opinions, imaginations, limiting associations of the memory which makes the basis of our mentality, to the current repetitions of our habitual mind, to the insistences of our pragmatic mind, to the limitations even of our intellectual truth mind, must go the way of other attachments and yield to the impartiality of an equal vision. The equal thought mind will look on knowledge and ignorance and on truth and error, those dualities created by our limited nature of consciousness and the partiality of our intellect and its little stock of reasonings and intuitions, accept them both without being bound to either twine of the skein and await a luminous transcendence in ignorance it will see a knowledge which is imprisoned and seeks or waits for delivery. In error, a truth at work which has lost itself or got thrown by the groping mind into misleading forms. On the other side, it will not hold itself bound and limited by its knowledge, or forbidden by it to proceed to fresh illumination, nor lay too fierce a grasp on truth, even when using it to the full, or tyrannously chain it to its present formulations. This perfect equality of the thinking mind is indispensable because the objective of this progress is the greater light which belongs to a higher plane of spiritual cognizance. This equality is the most delicate and difficult of all, the least practiced by the human mind. Its perfection is impossible so long as the supramental light does not fall fully on the upward-looking mentality. But an increasing will to equality in the intelligence is needed before that light can work freely upon the mental substance. This, too, is not an abnegation of the seekings and cosmic purposes of the intelligence, not an indifference or impartial skepticism, nor yet a stilling of all thought in the silence of the ineffable. A stilling of the mental thought may be part of the discipline, when the object is to free the mind from its own partial workings, in order that it may become an equal channel of a higher light and knowledge. But there must also be a transformation of the mental substance. Otherwise, the higher light cannot assume full possession and a compelling shape for the ordered works of the divine consciousness in the human being. The silence of the ineffable is a truth of divine being, but the word 
which proceeds from that silence is also a truth. And it is this word which has to be given a body in the conscious form of the nature. But finally, all this equalization of the nature is a preparation for the highest spiritual equality to take possession of the whole being and make a pervading atmosphere in which the light, power, and joy of the divine can manifest itself in man amid an increasing fullness. That equality is the eternal equality of Satchidananda. It is an equality of the infinite being, which is self-existent, an equality of the eternal spirit, but it will mold into its own mold the mind, heart, will, life, physical being. It is an equality of the infinite spiritual consciousness which will contain and base the blissful flowing and satisfied waves of a divine knowledge. It is an equality of the divine tapas which will initiate a luminous action of the divine will in all the nature. It is an equality of the divine ananda which will found the play of a divine universal delight, universal love, and an illimitable aesthesis of universal beauty. The ideal equal peace and calm of the infinite will be the wide ether of our perfected being. But the ideal, equal, and perfect action of the infinite through the nature working on the relations of the universe will be the untroubled outpouring of its power in our being. This is the meaning of equality in the terms of the integral yoga. Since knowledge, desirelessness, impersonality, equality, the inner self-existent peace and bliss, freedom from, or at least superiority to the tangled interlocking, of the three modes of nature are the signs of the liberated soul. They must accompany it in all its activities. They are the condition of that unalterable calm which this soul preserves in all the movement, all the shock, all the clash of forces which surround it in the world. That calm reflects the equable immutability of the Brahman in the midst of all mutations, and it belongs to the indivisible and impartial oneness, which is forever imminent in all the multiplicities of the universe. For an equal and all-equalizing spirit is that oneness in the midst of the million differences and inequalities of the world. And equality of the spirit is the sole real equality. For in all else in existence, there can only be similarity, adjustment, and balance. But even in the greatest similarities of the world, we find difference of inequality and difference of unlikeness, and the adjusted balancing of the world can only come about by a poising of combined 
unequal weights. Namaste.